Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, resource webinar platform, platform webinar. Um, I'm uh, Pierre Tardieu, Chief Policy Officer uh, at Wind Europe, um, and I will be uh, your host uh, for this uh, this afternoon's webinar. We have um, um, brought together four top experts uh, from the corporates and energy worlds uh, to give you a crash course on renewable uh, corporate sourcing. Um, and uh, this is what we will be uh, going through this uh, this afternoon. Um, Alexia, is it possible to go through the next slides? Okay, and perfect. Um, so this is a webinar that we are organizing in the run-up to the resource uh, event 2018. Um, this is uh, an event that's going to be taking place uh, in Amsterdam on the 20th and the 21st of, uh, of November at the Akura Hotel. Um, and basically this will uh, be a deep dive uh, on uh, renewable energy uh, corporate sourcing, uh, looking at uh, corporate sourcing strategies, business models, markets and regulation, uh, demand growth, and also some certain technical topics uh, like standardization uh, of uh, corporate renewable PPA contracts or additionality. Um, and this is one of the activities uh, of the resource platform uh, which brings, uh, which is organized uh, by ourselves, Wind Europe, uh, with our partners from Solar Power Europe, um, RE100 uh, with the Climate Group, and the World Business Council uh, for Sustainable Development. Um, and you can see here the steering committee of the resource platform, which brings together uh, a number of, um, of corporate buyers as well as. Uh, a uh, smaller number of companies from uh, from the uh, energy world. Um, basically, the uh, objectives of the resource platform uh, are threefold. Uh, if I can sum it up very quickly, it's lobbying uh, for uh, for the development of corporate uh, corporate sourcing, educating, raising awareness, uh, and ultimately, and perhaps most importantly. Uh, providing business opportunities, uh, B2B meetings uh, between buyers um, and sellers. So without further ado, what I would like to do is uh, give in a second the floor uh, to Sonia Dunlop, who's the Senior Policy Advisor uh, at our partners from Solar Power Europe. Uh, before I do that, uh, two housekeeping points. Um, the first one is I should uh, mention that you can already access the full presentation uh, in the uh, handout, so you will see this on the right side of your screen. Uh, there's a master uh, PowerPoint in, in PDF. Um, and I would also invite you to uh, send your questions uh, via the text box that you have uh, as they occur to you during the presentation. Uh, we will take questions after each of the individual presentations. Uh, not at the end, but after each of the presentations, so that uh, the discussion uh, remains fresh and, and, and lively to the extent possible. We will keep this uh, to uh, one hour. Okay, uh, so uh, Sonia, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pierre. So, as Pierre said, my name is Sonia Dunlop. I'm a Senior Policy Advisor at Solar Power Europe. And I'm going to present today some analysis we did here within the resource platform and within Solar Power Europe as to what are the different business models on offer when you're looking to do a corporate sourcing deal. We call this our 14 models of corporate sourcing. Many of them are PPAs, but they are not all PPAs. So this is not 14 PPAs, as it is often called, uh, but rather 14 models of corporate sourcing. Just to say, if you want to know more about these models, you can get in touch and you can come to the event in Amsterdam where we are going to zoom in on some of these models and look at them in more detail. Today, I can obviously only give a very brief overview of these models. So let's get going. Model number one, this is the simplest form of corporate sourcing in a way. This is self-owned on-site renewables. So this is simply where a corporate power consumer invests in and owns a renewable installation on-site. And that can be on the roof of the building or on land in the, uh, around the building, uh, the, the building the, the corporate power consumers land around the building and this is entirely self-owned and therefore also self-consumption behind the meter. 
model number two. This is the leasing model. So again, this is an on-site form of corporate sourcing where the renewable installation is on-site, either on the roof of the building or on land surrounding it. And here, instead of it being self-owned, the renewable installation is owned by a third party and leased to the solar to, co to the corporate power consumer. This is done via a leasing contract where the corporate power consumer pays a fixed fee per month or per year to use the electricity that is generated by the renewable installation. Note, it is a fixed fee for the use of the system, not a fee per kilowatt hour. That brings us to the third model, which is the on-site PPA, where again, the renewable installation, either a solar PV array or a wind turbine or two, is on site, on the site of the corporate power consumer. And here, a PPA is signed by the third party owner, between the third party owner of the renewable installation and the corporate power consumer, selling the electricity generated at a price agreed per kilowatt hour to the corporate consumer. This price can be a, a fixed price over a period of time, which can be 5, 10, 15, 20 years, or can be a price that is indexed to a market price in retail, retail electricity or, there, uh, or with, a, with a discount or something similar to that. So that is an on-site PPA model. Number four, this is a private wire PPA model. Now here, the renewable installation, which can be solar or wind, is located on a piece of land or a site that is perhaps three or five or 10 kilometers away from the corporate power consumer. And a direct wire, a private direct wire or direct line is built to to link the two sites and to feed the electricity in behind the meter to the corporate power consumer. So here, we this is still behind the meter. This is not using the private grid. And this involves the construction of a dedicated private wire or direct wire between the renewable installation and the corporate power consumer. In some countries, there are significant barriers to building such private wires. In others, it's relatively easy. So this is one of the models we are definitely looking at to try and make possible in all 28 member states and indeed the whole of Europe. Model number five is self-owned off-site renewables. So here, the corporate power consumer invests in and owns the renewable installation, but this is an off-site corporate sourcing model. So the, the renewable installation is not directly linked to the corporate power consumer's installation and is elsewhere in the country. This model can often be known as the IKEA model. IKEA is one of the companies that has chosen to adopt this model and invest in and own renewable installations. Model number six, so here we've started the off-site corporate sourcing models. So this is the sleeved PPA, arguably one of the, mo the more common forms of PPA corporate sourcing in Europe to date. This is where the renewable installation is located elsewhere on the grid in that, in that country. And the power is sleeved via a sleeving utility who um, wheels the power through the grid and uh, deals with the balancing responsibilities as well to the corporate power consumer. This utility is usually but not always the utility that also supplies that corporate power consumer with any residual electricity demand. This model, the sleeved PPA model, can also be called the back-to-back -back PPA or physical PPA. Model number seven is the virtual PPA, where, again, the renewable installation sells its power into the grid, into the wholesale market, and the corporate power consumer buys power uh, from its usual supplier. What happens here is that an additional contract is concluded between the corporate and the renewable installation, a virtual PPA contract, also known as a synthetic PPA, a financial PPA, or a CFD contract for difference. And th this strike price is a fixed price over uh, an extended period of time, perhaps 10, 15, 20 years. And the two sides agree to, to honor that price uh, uh, no matter what the fluctuations are. So this is a price that is set 
a fixed price that is set over a long period of time and if the power that the price that the corporate pays for its power goes up above that price the generator pays the corporate and if it goes down the corporate pays the generator this is akin to a financial hedging product model number eight this is the mini utility model a mini utility ppa here instead of um, contracting with a sleeving utility, the corporate power consumer, usually a big corporate power consumer, can decide to actually create its own mini utility. It creates a, a single purpose vehicle, a special purpose vehicle, which then takes on the responsibilities of the sleeving utility, gains a supply license in that country, and has the responsibility to sleeve the power from the grid, uh, uh, to, from the renewable installation to the corporate power consumer. This is usually only viable in with large corporate power consumers. The ninth model, apologies, the ninth model is the multi-buyer PPA model. Simply put, this is where multiple corporate buyers come together to form a buying club and buy electricity together from the renewable installations. Um, the advantage here is this can reduce the credit worthiness risk or the counterparty risk for the renewable side of the, of the deal uh, as there are then multiple corporate buyers, buyers therefore spreading the risk. So this is the multi-buyer PPA, but you can, on the other side, also in Model 10, essentially have a multi-seller PPA where multiple renewable installations aggregate themselves or are aggregated into um, a, a, a selling club and together sell power to a single corporate buyer consumer or indeed any permutation of those two options. Model number 11, this is the proxy revenue swap. Also known, a similar version of this is the volume firming agreement. So this is a model that has been pioneered in the United States market, as indeed have many of these models, where uh, it's quite complicated, but simply put, I think the easiest way of explaining it is that the uh, there is an insurance entity that ensures the revenues of the the renewable installation. Of course, the, the renewables installation's revenues may vary as according to the power price in the market and according to weather risk, to weather changes. And so the insurer ensures the revenue of the renewable installation and then the corporate power consumer then insures the insurer, thereby meaning that the risk is passed on and the project can come forward and possibly uh, have access to cheaper finance. So it is, it is, I think the easiest way of thinking about this is that it's a double insurance where often the corporate power consumer is exposed to electricity price risks uh, uh, in general. And so um, there can be a bit of a win-win here where uh, both the insurer and the corporate power consumer can ensure the renewable installation. Model number 12, so this is the cross-border PPA. This is simply the, any, most of the models I've just described can also be done across national borders. We have a few examples of this in Europe, not many that we're aware of so far, but here, for example, the synthetic or, or virtual PPA model I described earlier could be done across borders. Say, for example, a Swedish wind farm selling power to a Germany, for example. Model number 13, this is green electricity supply. So this is where the utility that is supplying power, the residual power demand to the corporate consumer, um, uh, can also supply renewable, re renewably generated power to that corporate consumer. So it will go out and buy power from renewables, aggregate that, develop a portfolio probably, and then sell that on to the corporate consumer. So that is what we would call green electricity supply. Now, of course, all the models I've just described involve also the transfer of guarantee of origin certificates as a way of tracing or certifying the consumption of green power. 
However, it is also possible, model number 14, to purely buy the unbundled guarantees of origin. And I see two, we see two main ways of doing this, either by the corporate power consumer directly buying the guarantees of origin, which is the lower of the two diagrams, or the utility that is supplying power backing up its green electricity offer purely with unbundled guarantee of origin certificates. This is a very uh, common way of doing corporate sourcing in Europe to date, but more and more we are seeing corporates move to other forms of corporate sourcing described in the previous models. So those are the 14 models of corporate sourcing. Um, if you want more information, do come to Amsterdam to find out more. For you as a corporate buyer to take your pick and see which you think um, best fits your needs. Um, so that's all from me and I'd like to hand, up, hand back to Pierre for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So uh, many thanks for this uh, for this very comprehensive presentation. We have received a couple of questions uh, from the audience uh, for you, Sonia. So the first is: Is there an overview of barriers uh, to these uh, different options per EU country? So obviously that's quite comprehensive. Uh, but, uh, but do we have uh, do we have a sense of you know? Where some of these models are easier uh, than than you know uh, than than other places. Yes, we do. So here within the resource platform, we are conducting an analysis of these 14 different models of corporate sourcing, and the 28 member states uh, in Europe to try and understand so which of these models are. Um, possible in which member states, if not, why not, and what are the barriers. So that is an analysis that we're in the process of conducting um, and we, we hope to have more on this soon, um, a bit of a country, country, by, by, country by country analysis of the different models. Okay, what we're finding, fantastic. sorry, just to say, what we're finding is that um, uh, the barriers to the different models vary hugely from country to country. So in some countries there are restrictions on signing long-term PPAs, more than five years say. On other countries it is very difficult to build a direct line. So there's a huge amount of variety and part of what we're trying to do as the resource platform is bring some kind of standardization both on transactions but also on uh, policy uh, and regulation. Okay, a quick question on um, understanding the difference between those two models, uh, between two different types of models. Um, can you explain the difference between model number five, uh, which is self-owned off-site, and number six, which is the sleeved PPA? Yes, so the difference there is quite simply just in the ownership of the renewable assets. So in the self-owned off-site, um, uh, the renewable asset is actually owned by the corporate consumer, um, uh, whereas in the sleeved PPA, the renewable asset is owned by a third party, a developer or uh, energy supplier. In both cases, you're right, the two models are very similar in the sense that in both cases, the power is sleeved through the grid via a sleeving utility or middleman, um, but the, the, the difference there is in terms of ownership of the renewable asset. Okay. Excellent. Um, so thank you once more, uh, Sonia. We will uh, move on to the uh, second presentation now, which is from uh, Constant Larcon, who manages the RE100 campaign on behalf uh, of the Climate Group and who will be talking about how to put together a long-term corporate sourcing strategy. Constant, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Pierre. Thank you, uh, Sonia, as well, for this great presentation uh, and for this overview of, of the various sourcing models. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is talking a little bit about how to set up a long-term renewable energy strategy, how to navigate the various models that Sonia has just presented, how to think about them in the context of your broader uh, business and sustainability uh, strategy. So, First, maybe a very quick um, presentation of uh, ORI 100. Uh, ORI 100 is an initiative led by the Climate Group in partnership with CDP that brings together large influential businesses that commit to source 100% of um, their electricity from renewable sources. 
um, we now have over 150 members that have signed up to the initiative and all together they consume over 180 terawatt hour of electricity which is to give you an idea more than a country like Egypt or, or Thailand so it's a significant a significant mass of companies that have the ability uh, to change markets and to work together to increase the uptake of renewable energy uh, worldwide what is interesting uh, in companies making the commitment is that of course sustainability concerns um, is one of the reasons why companies are making the commitment and is one of the driver for companies to source renewable energy but what we have seen in the last couple of years is that the economics argument is getting stronger and stronger and more and more companies are telling us that they have committed to source all their power from renewable sources because the economics of renewable energy are changing and all becoming something that um, that they take a bet on. So first, why should you consider setting up a long-term um, renewable electricity strategy? Of course, it helps to get uh, buy-in and getting internal buy-in is essential. There's two categories of stakeholder that you need to convince when you set up a target. Your senior leadership, of course, but also the other teams that uh, are going to work with you uh, to implement this commitment. And that's why putting things on paper and thinking about the various criteria that are supposed to drive your uh, renewable energy sourcing strategy is essential. It also increases the chances of successful delivery. By setting up a strategy, you can focus on making sure you maximize the business benefits of this strategy uh, and doing things in a way that will not only be beneficial for the environment, but also uh, beneficial for uh, your business, uh, either through cost savings uh, or through increasing your reputations uh, to your customers, etc., etc. What we think is very powerful is that by setting up a strategy, you also maximize the environmental and climate impact of your sourcing approaches. By, being, by going public and um, by adopting an official strategy to source renewables, you send a very strong signal to the markets as an individual company, of course, but also as a company that, um, um, that is part of a broader movement of corporate sourcing uh, that can really transform renewable electricity markets and it gives confidence to suppliers that demand will be there and therefore uh, increases their um, offers uh, and the solutions they can offer to business to businesses like yours but also to other businesses that maybe are not ready to make similar commitments because of uh, the various barriers they might encounter on the way one thing that i would like to note is that 86 percent uh, of our members have a policy that defines their goals and the approaches uh, to achieve this goal uh, and half of those um, strategies are public. So if you don't have a renewable energy strategy, it's a great place to start. Look at other companies that have signed up to our initiative or others, go on their website and see um, what are they doing. One thing that I'd like to talk about very quickly is, is what comes first when you set up a renewable electricity strategy. Do you set up a goal first um, and then uh, look at how you're going to reach this target? Or do you, um, do you adopt more of a bottom-up approach where the target is built on the company's current performance and on a detailed analysis of where um, they could get to? Um, we definitely see both approaches being chosen by companies. And in the last month, uh, we had a large retailer that uh, came to us and that made the commitment uh, to source 100% uh, of the electricity from renewable sources after doing a very detailed analysis of where the current um, operations where, uh, what solutions existed for each of the countries where they've got operation, and only then uh, they were confident enough to uh, make this commitment. On the other hand, we had a company that came to us and had said, our board has asked us to source 100% um, of our electricity from renewable sources. We don't know exactly how to do that yet, but we are going to make the commitment and we'll work together to um, set up a detailed strategy. This diagram comes from a report that we published a few weeks ago with a uh, French consultancy company Capgemini Invent. And it describes six steps um, that um, 
a company uh, needs uh, to take to set up a renewable electricity strategy. Uh, it goes mostly clockwise, but it is not a linear process. So don't think that you have to do step number one before doing step number two. Um, but what it shows is that there are six things that need to be done. And actually, you usually go from one to the other and then come back to the previous one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to, to go very quickly through them, um, the first one is to get uh, senior leadership support for a commitment to source more renewables and an agreement on the criteria that you're going to use to source uh, those, uh, this electricity. Create a multidisciplinary governance model uh, and, and a multidisciplinary team is essential. Um, we have never seen a company where a single person is in charge of uh, the renewable energy strategy. You will have your CSR team, your energy team, your procurement team. All those people need, need to be brought together um, to, uh, to define what those goals uh, and uh, criteria for sourcing should be. There is an essential mapping exercise to do, looking at where your operations are, what, are their, what, what, what is their current electricity consumption? What solutions exist in each of those markets where they're located? Um, and, and where can you get to uh, with which uh, approaches? Having um, a regulatory and retail price watch is very important as well. You need to understand your context of where your operations are happening. Finally, tracking the benefits of your renewable energy strategy. Very quickly, when it comes to defining your goal, there are several questions that you should take into account. What does the science require in terms of decarbonization for my electricity consumption? What are the existing targets that I already have? Uh, do I have a carbon reduction target? Um, do I have a science-based target, uh, etc.? Most companies also look at what is the standard for their industry in terms of uh, renewable electricity ambition, and then um, what is a feasible target and approach uh, for their own businesses. To assess your options, there are a set of internal and external factors that you have to uh, look at. I'm not going to go into the details of them, but um, this is uh, basically assessing what are your constraints uh, to, add, to um, use some of the um, methods that Sonia uh, has uh, described in, in, in a very clear way. So depending on where you're based, depending on uh, whether you've got CAPEX or OPEX available, uh, whether you've got some renewable energy um, expertise um, internally will make a difference and will define what sourcing strategies you should prioritize. I'm not going to go into those approaches because Sonia went to them. We've got a, a slightly different way of cutting them, but, but it's, it's basically the same, uh, the same content. Um, what is interesting to note, though, is that ORI 100 members and, and companies that source renewable energy in general usually adopt a mix of approaches to meet the target. So you don't only use one of the 14 approaches that Sonia described. You use a mix of them depending on where your operations are and depending on you know, a specific time, the size of your load in a specific place, etc. What we have observed in the last couple of years is a, is a growth in energy uh, sourced through PPAs. And I think that is interesting because, again, it illustrates the kind of changing landscape for renewables. One uh, last important point to note is that, of course, you should look at the various methods to source renewables. But you should look also beyond that and include in your strategy what else you can do at the, organi at the orga organizational level to increase the uptake of renewable electricity. And you can look at um, including um, renewable electricity as a priority in your influencing strategy at the corporate level. For example, you should uh, or you could try to influence your peers or influence your customers to maximize the impact of your uh, of the progress you have made. Another thing you can do is looking at the sustainability of the project, of the renewable electricity project that you're supporting. For example, if you buy electricity from a biomass plant, uh, you can look at various um, sustainability certification for this biomass plant to make sure that you maximize uh, the environmental impact for local communities. 
the two other criteria that I haven't covered are uh, being transparent about um, your success and failure uh, and about what you're doing, uh, but also looking at always increasing the ambition of your targets, uh, you know, reviewing where you are and looking whether you could be more ambitious uh, is definitely uh, something that should be part of your strategy. I'm going to pass through that because we don't have that much time left. But just to to um, to conclude, um, what is very important as well is to collaborate with others, and that's partly uh, the reason why we decided to create the resource platform. Working with your peers, working with suppliers, working in NGOs uh, will help you uh, to design strategies that are more impactful from an environmental perspective while maximizing the business benefits for your organization. Um, Sandra mentioned, uh, the, Sonia mentioned the example of buyers coming together uh, to buy, uh, to sign a larger PPA. That is definitely a way in which collaboration can help you to maximize your impact. Use existing resources, either uh, free and public ones or the ones developed by uh, suppliers and solutions uh, providers. Be transparent about your success and failures and review your goals uh, uh, and strategy periodically to see if you can increase the overall level of your ambition. Finally, be ambitious and bold. And you know, we believe at ORI 100 that the 100% target is one that is truly transformative because it doesn't, doesn't leave any space for hesitation. But of course, um, always look at what is right for your company and try to get as far uh, as you can within those constraints. And this is it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Constant. That was extremely helpful. Um, we have one question from the audience, uh, which is to you and also potentially to, to Sonia. I mean, is there an overview of the uh, respective benefits of the different models uh, that we've been citing? So you mentioned, Constant, that uh, indeed there were these 14 models. You sliced the pie slightly differently. Uh, and, and say that it's, uh, companies are going to use uh, you know, a, a variety of models, a, a, um, a combination. Um, is there an overview of you know, the benefits and the drawbacks of, uh, of each of the models? We have published a report in August looking at uh, business leadership in the energy transition that provides an overview of um, the various advantages uh, and uh, disadvantages of those uh, sourcing strategies, more from an environmental perspective. Um, there is information as well uh, on the um, benefits for your uh, business, uh, as a you know, in terms of economic benefits, for example. Um, but it, it mostly focuses on environmental benefits. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, we will move on to uh, today's uh, third presentation. Um, if uh, we can move on to the uh, to the next slides, um, and this is uh, this is Javier Bacariso, who's the head of uh, global commercial office at NL Green Power, and he's going to be discussing structuring and pricing of long-term uh, power purchase agreements. Uh, Javier, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, well, I will try to touch base on mainly uh, the outside PPA uh, alternatives uh, presented by Sonia. Um, and I will try to, to bring some uh, of the barriers, some of the issues and concerns, uh, both for corporate purchases and, and projects. So uh, I would say that uh, when, when starting with a sourcing strategy, of course, this is a very simple decision tree, uh, but is the, the decision on how to buy renewables, term uh, yields, bundled, unbundled, bulk yields versus project yields, which kind of a structure do we want for, for price, for volume, uh, financial, physical, is going to impact uh, a lot the way uh, a PPA is negotiated, uh, and I will try to give an overview on, on some of the features of, of, of the physical PPIs and the virtual PPIs that we are starting to see in Europe uh, uh, and in some of those developments. So starting with a very simple um, uh, uh, low chart, uh, positional chart, uh, I think that for off-site PPIs, 
uh, maybe the, the corporates are, are trying to find out which is the best way uh, to, to <clears throat> uh, fulfill their commitments in terms of sustainability and also to take advantage of uh, uh, benefits uh, of a long-term deal with renewable fuels in terms of risk uh, management, risk reduction, and also potential savings uh, uh, versus uh, uh, market prices. Uh, but of course, we have some issues, some uh, barriers. Uh, regarding the the financial PPAs, I think that the best that the, the first uh, issue and the, the the main concern is accounting, uh, and also I would say the uh, the the how to build a financial PPA that is a real hedge for for the customer uh, electricity price risk. We will see some very simple examples uh, uh, afterwards about that. Uh, regarding the physical PPA world, um, I mean, I think that the main barriers are now hard regulatory barriers. Um, and also, those barriers are, uh, uh, let's say, more difficult to overcome for a, a corporate buyer depending on the way they, they want to, to establish a, a, a mixed structure between a part of the load contracted through renewables with the long-term PPAs and part of the load contracted through short-term um, license supply uh, deals. So uh, I will try to touch base also about these physical PPA issues afterwards. So mainly about these two main concerns, so accounting for financial um, and, and probably the, the uh, how to structure physical PPAs, mixing short term and long term. Um, I think that also GOs are one of the main uh, topics here. Uh, it's a, a lot of things are going on in the, in the European discussions about the new energy package. Um, and uh, I think that one of the main concerns is how the different tracking systems are going to be harmonized in the future. Um, and uh, just to introduce these uh, following examples uh, about physical and financial PPAs uh, issues, uh, this is a very simple diagram showing all the potential players that, uh, in, in, an, in a synthetic, let's say, wholesale and, and the user market. And, and I think this is going to be key in order to understand how to negotiate and how to structure real deals. Uh, when we talk about um, uh, closing the long-term PPA just for a portion of the load, uh, of course, some questions uh, are there. First of all, can I mix short-term and long-term with the same uh, uh, supplier? Can I contract directly with the project, the physical PPA? Um, how can I switch and change retailer in the future just for the short-term portion that I contracted with a one-year, two-year contract, uh, keeping the launcher PPA as it is? Which are the implications? Uh, a lot of regulatory issues are embedded in that, in that uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and I, I will show an example afterwards in order to, to give you just some uh, insight about that. Regarding the financial PPS, of course, the accounting treatment is, is the key. Uh, I will not enter into detail because talking about IRFS rules uh, would take uh, uh, thorough hours of discussion. Um, but also it's important not only the accounting treatment, but also to be sure that when entering into a financial PPA, a CFD contract, uh, we are effectively hedging the risk uh, we want to hedge uh, on, on the uh, corporate purchase uh, side. Um, and then uh, regulation. Regulation, I would say that there are not, uh, there are not many barriers in order to, to make long-term bilateral contracts in Europe. Uh, but in fact, we do have some issues regarding um, uh, the, the way the physical supply is uh, is uh, is written in, in some rules in some markets. 
Uh, and I will give you one example. I would say that the, the, the bilateral negotiation, uh, something that we can skip. I will give you an example afterwards. Uh, just wanted to mention before entering into these very simple examples uh, that negotiating a long-term PPA is very, is very different uh, compared to negotiating a uh, short-term supply that is based on the standard, uh, uh, probably standard contract conditions. Uh, the PPAs are tailor-made and uh, long-term contracts are, are, are not very common uh, contracts in, for, for a lot of customers. A lot of industrials. Uh, moreover, the energy uh, uh, technicalities are not that they're part of their core businesses. So I would say that just trying to summarize uh, in a very simple way uh, how to approach that. Of course, we need to work um, on the structure. So the, the, the customers, the, the, the corporates, needs to uh, decide. Uh, how much risk they are willing to take and in a change of what and also the project the renewable project should be uh, focusing on uh, providing some flexibilities but all, always keeping an eye on the bankability of the project so that we can say that a starting on a ppl long-term ppl negotiation process is a matter of understanding flexibilities and the price risk trade-off uh, so with a very simple approach, the more risk we are willing to take, the lower price we will have. But in fact, there are some limitations uh, for the project in terms of bankability. And also, depending on the rules on each market, we can uh, find out that uh, starting this long-term PP negotiation is also a matter of engaging uh, third parties like lenders, like uh, market operators, system operators, some electricity retailers, uh, or some um, wholesale market agents as well. Uh, a part of the, any broker or advisor that could be uh, in the middle of the transaction. So I would say that uh, these risk sharing and risk allocation uh, is key in order to, to, uh, to, to, to close these kind of deals. And, uh, this is the reason why I would say that uh, after deciding the strategy in terms of sustainability, uh, when approaching PPN negotiation, the, the, the customers, the, the, the corporates, should be uh, starting deciding the level of risk and the kind of products they, they uh, prefer to, to close. Uh, I would say that I, I'm, from those 14 models, I would say that the offside ones are more or less eight or nine of them. I group them in these uh, two um, uh, groups, so keeping uh, just the focus on the offside. So physical is live and financial. Um, in the presentation, you have some uh, uh, concepts about those, and also pros and cons. Uh, the main uh, pro uh, uh, of, of physical uh, PPA, I would say that is uh, no no accounting uh, problems for that. But of course, if you have very uh, spare loads uh, and you want to to fulfill a commitment based on on the carbon footprint reduction with uh, with geos uh, for very different loads located in different places, uh, probably financial PPA uh, would be uh, helpful. But of course, uh, both of them are, uh, are different and, and have uh, pros and cons. So just let me give you these, uh, those examples I mentioned in the beginning. So how, for example, how to make a financial PPA uh, a real hedge. So we have some experience in, experiences in the past, more over in the United States, for example, where uh, some corporates entered into uh, virtual PPA CFDs uh, having fixed contract, a fixed price contract with the, the their utilities for the, the physical supply. In that case, uh, that approach is not a real hedge for the electricity price. We will see afterwards uh, a numerical, very simple example. Uh, 
but on the other way around, if if uh, you have an index price structure for your physical supply uh, for that volume that you contracted uh, through the CFD, uh, and the uh, underlying price is the same for that portion of the volume, you will have a better uh, you will have a hedge. This is probably a very simple uh, uh, vision on, on that, but uh, I think it's very important to, to clarify the simple concepts, uh, probably for, for the experts in, in the energy world, it's, it's a very uh, uh, simple uh, concept, but I think that it's very important to differentiate that it's it's a very different approach to entry into a long-term financial PPS just uh, in order to capture a potential positive net present value, but taking, on the other hand, a lot of risk, or to, to put in place a real long-term hedge that is uh, uh, removing part of the price risk for, for your electricity cost. And regarding the physical PPAs, as I mentioned, uh, some of the regulatory schemes in Europe uh, don't allow multiple supply contracts, physical contracts for a single point of delivery. Uh, so these that should be um, a minor uh, detail is becoming uh, an issue when when, when when some corporates are trying to enter into long-term PPS just for a portion of their loads. In this case, uh, I, I won't enter into, into detail the technicalities, um, uh, but we have some questions to, to be answered here. So how can I uh, change and, and, and switch retailer in the future for the, the, the short-term part if I cannot have two physical supplies for the same point of delivery? Imagining that you have just one facility with one point of delivery. In that case, with the regulation enforced today in those markets in which these uh, these is in place, uh, we can find some workarounds with some legal language in the contract, uh, putting in place some rules in order to regulate that that potential um, retail uh, shifting. Uh, but of course, uh, some additional regulatory developments. Uh, uh, bringing the possibility of um, having a, a perimeter of different sourcing uh, for the same uh, point of delivery somehow would be uh, very helpful in the future. I think that uh, probably in some countries uh, uh, these discussions are starting to be in place also um, uh, on the regulator table and uh, it will be very interesting in the future to see how this, this uh, can be harmonized as well. European level. Uh, so, and just to, to, to finish, this is a very simple numerical example about why uh, having a long term financial PPA together with a fixed price um, physical delivery could be a problem in terms of price risk and uh, how this long term CFD PPA becomes a hedge, a real hedge, uh, in case of having this uh, index um, uh, physical contract, you can see afterwards in the presentation. And, uh, uh, and this is a little explanation about uh, uh, the, the, the importance of dealing with accounting treatment from the beginning of the negotiation of the PPA in case of entry to a financial one. I think it's very important. It, it, uh, some of the accounting rules are are some judgmental things. And I think that the sooner uh, uh, the accounting colleagues of each organization, both supplier and, and corporate, uh, are engaged and involved in this uh, negotiation, the sooner the better. Um, and uh, just to finish, if I may go forward, okay. And as I mentioned, uh, physical PPS that I think so far, for some European countries, are more based on on, on green uh, uh, green electricity supply, uh, the model through utilities that Sony mentioned in the beginning. And um, I think that the, this uh, uh, issue that I mentioned regarding how to deal with a, a, a mixed solution, long-term 
short term with different uh, contract structure and how to uh, respect the, the right for, for the consumer to switch from one retailer to another. How can we manage that uh, in the contract or in the regulation is one of the probably one of the, of the issues that we're facing today. So I finished. Thank you very much. I just wanted to give an, uh, an overview on some barriers, some digital barriers, and without entering into too much detail. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Um, we have received one question, which I will uh, I will take. Is there a potential to allow multiple suppliers per point of delivery at EU level policy? Uh, indeed, uh, there is, uh, and this is one of the points that the resource platform is is working on, uh, and we will be uh, delving more into this uh, at the event uh, at the end of the month. So with that, uh, I would propose to move on to the final presentation uh, for today. Um, and this is a presentation from um, Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance. Uh, Helen, if uh, yes, uh, just moving on to the end uh, to the final uh, slide deck here. Um, Helen Dewurst uh, and Helen will be um, basically giving us a forecast of the PPA markets uh, in Europe. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the first thing to caveat my presentation really is that there isn't necessarily a, a, a way to tell um, what the pipeline of deals looks like just because of the nature of um, as probably many of you have experienced um, the closed nature of negotiations um, between the developer and off-taker parties however um, if we look at what has come before it's always a very good indication um, and at the end we'll look at RE100 activity um, and, and commitments and, and look at how that can also show us, um, give, give us some sort of idea of, of a forecast within the region. So as you can see here, um, this is the breakdown of countries um, that have signed, in which deals have been signed. And so this shows you where um, it, where the, there's a very established and mature PPA market um, and, and this shows us where we are likely to see more deals coming. Um, so, so in particular calling out the Nordics, um, Norway, Sweden and, and now starting to see some activity in Finland as well. Um, the UK um, and Ireland have been quite significant markets, um, less so in recent, um, in, in the last couple of years really, since the um, demise of the ROC scheme. Um, but we, we expect activity to pick up in both markets, um, in Ireland in particular, as growth is um, demand growth is driven by the, the large number of data centers um, that, that are expected to come online. In fact, by 2030, 75% of um, Ireland's demand growth will be driven by data centers. And, and the, the large um, tech companies who, uh, who will be developing these um, have very ambitious sustainability targets and we, we don't expect the, the centers to be constructed without um, renewable energy sourcing in place. So, um, so yes, this is the, cu the country breakdown of where we can expect PPA activity to take place. Um, in terms of technology, um, wind has really dominated in, in Europe. Um, biomass and other technologies are, are almost non-existent. Um, and solar, where, whereas solar technologies have been very popular, um, more generally, it doesn't seem to be a popular um, technology to use when signing the deals. Um, there's there's no particular reason for this. Um, probably what's driving it is the, uh, the the large aluminium smelters 
in Norway and Sweden who sign the largest deals and therefore have the most significant impact on the numbers, um, they use wind um, because um, the, the number of sunlight hours is obviously far inferior to the wind, the generous wind resources that are in the Nordic region. So um, that that's probably driving the majority of this trend. But as um, as companies try to um, be, be a bit more smart with how they balance energy inputs, um, they might want to complement the the shoulder hours that are supported by wind with with solar generated during the day um, to improve the reliability of um, of energy inputs. Um, in terms of off taker type, um, so we expect to see more. Um, we expect to see more diversity. Uh, so far, the, the story has been really dominated by um, tech, technology companies and manufacturing, um, in particular the aluminium smelters, as I just mentioned, in the Nordics. Um, but, but really, uh, the story is one of increasingly diverse companies um, signing up to these deals. Um, and for example, financials is, is not necessarily a huge bar um, in, in any particular year, but the um, it, it tends to be because the demand profile of financial companies isn't hugely significant. So when they do sign a deal, it may only be for, for a small number of megawatts. Um, but saying that, that, that there's a great range of companies who are starting to look into it and lots of the FTSE 100 companies who are um, financial institutions are, um, are very active in this space. Um, just to summarise then, um, so I, I, I've talked about the, the different markets where we expect um, activity to happen. Um, broadly, uh, um, as part of um, the research that I do, um, I, I've, I've grouped markets into three categories. Um, so, so sort of what what drives the, the top three markets, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, um, markets to really keep an eye on, um, Spain, Ireland and the UK. And, um, and then also looking at um, Germany, Italy and France, the respect to their notable lack of activity, um, given that, for example, all three um, have some of the largest renewable energy build by capacity in the world. Um, much of this has not been driven by PPAs. And um, with Italy and France, we expect this to continue. Germany, um, maybe we, we may see some more activity there, but um, it's it's fairly unlikely that it will drive new renewable builds um, uh, in the um, in in the short term. Um, it, it's it's likely that as the EEG subsidy is phased out, um, PPAs will be signed for um, for for existing projects that are coming to the, that are coming to the end of their operational life, but still need to secure revenue at that merchant tail end. Um, so we're, we're already starting to see, uh, there, there were three deals signed this year for, um, um, for those cases. Um, and, and then I mentioned earlier that we, we, we tried to do an analysis using RE100 member demand. Um, and and this has been uh, this has been taken from company filings that um, that give us their existing energy demand and also their commitments to to how how fast they want to drive um, they they want to drive towards their hundred percent target um, and also the climate group who have um, provided us with uh with all of the company um data and also some contacts so we're really grateful to to be working with them on this um and and what this shows really is that um given the number of companies that have signed up to the initiative today um 
and looking at their projected demand, electricity demand, um, alongside their commitments to to cover this with um, clean electricity, um, and 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 then sort of subtracting their their existing um, certificate purchases and contracted wind and solar on-site generation. We see a demand gap of 196 terawatt hours, and this is really significant. This this is a huge gap that, um, in theory, if you know, assuming all is well and the companies um, meet their commitments, they will um, they will need to fill this gap with renewable energy. So um, th this is the kind of demand gap that um, we're, we're really excited about. We, we expect um, a significant portion of it to be covered by PPAs. Um, there, there will obviously be other um, other methods used, but if this is used as a, as a sort of general benchmark, then um, then we see the the PPA market only going from strength to strength. And this is the, the picture for Europe in particular, um, where we see 70 terawatt hours of renewable generation that must be uh, switched over to clean energy by 2030 by Europe domiciled companies. And uh, I, I believe we're over time, but if, if um, there are any questions, I would be delighted to take them. Great, Helen. We will be closing shortly, but we did receive one question uh, on your presentation. So, why are most PPA signed in the Nordic countries? Is it a function of power market regulation, uh, or is it something else? And what needs to be basically replicated, implemented in other countries for PPAs to take off? Um, it's a really good question. Um, so, there's there's a few factors driving it. Um, in Norway, in particular, there's an interesting um, guarantee that the Export Credit Guarantee Agency provide. Um, it's the the fact that all deals, um, all the off takers, are provided with triple A credit rating. Um, so so that it's it's kind of risk free um, in terms of off taker risk when developers sign deals there. Um, this is really unique. It, it's not seen in any other country in the world. Um, but, but essentially, it means that if the corporate fails for some reason and it defaults on its payments, the developer can guarantee that they will get that revenue from the the GEIK agency. Um, and then, in, in general, Sweden, Norway, it's um, it, it's quite a sort of um, bog standard reason really it, they've just got fantastic resources um, both both in terms of wind and availability of land but also technical resources um, and and sort of the professional um, precedent that's been set by by signing these deals there's a lot of knowledge and know-how in those markets um, it's regarded as quite a safe place to do them um, the fact that um, companies have signed repeat deals there um, is, a, is a sort of indication that the, the, the deliverance in terms of um, price stability is, is very uh, it, it's very secure um, so other co corporates who aren't party to these deals can have lots of comp can take confidence in the fact that um, it's it, the um, price advantage will deliver. And then I think the last major point um, that, that I could probably go on, but um, it is the fact that um, there's there's an LSA scheme um, in in terms of kind of price in general. There's a, there's an LSA scheme where you can trade um, the electricity tickets that you're awarded when you gener um, generate renewable electricity, and that provides a kind of a, a sweetener. Um, a deal sweetener um, in terms of you know an extra source of revenue that you can generate from the deals as as a, a power producer um, you can you can trade the, um, the certificates that you're awarded um, and also um, the wholesale prices are really low um, in general but also very volatile so um, because, because of the high 
um, penetration of hydro in both energy grid mixes. Um, if, if hydro uh, is, is being temperamental in terms of um, uh, having a very dry summer, for example, or um, a sudden uh, uh, infl um, influx of snow melt, um, this can drive prices up or down very quickly. Um, prices are known to double within a week. So even though they are generally low, um, which means that the benchmark price for PPA set is low, um, they have a real propensity to suddenly shoot up and therefore hedging against this is, is really valuable. It's, it's particularly valuable in those markets. Okay, fantastic. That was uh, thanks for that very very comprehensive response, uh, and uh, and for taking us through the uh, what you expect to happen uh, on corporate renewable PPAs, uh, notably in Europe, in the years to come, based on the experience that we have uh, so far. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to um, close the webinar in a second. I really encourage all of you uh, who want to dig in deeper to join us. Uh, in Amsterdam on the 20th and the 21st uh, of November. I should mention also that there will be another uh, webinar um, coming up, and this is specifically on choosing between physical and virtual power purchase agreements, uh, and that will take place on the 13th of, never, of November from 4 to 5. So without uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining us today, uh, and please uh, stay in touch uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Good afternoon.